to all you wonderful, amazing listeners out there. A very warm welcome to the Nikhil Hogan Show. It's a huge honor to have the great Professor Giorgio Sanguinetti return to the program for his second appearance. He is the author of the award-winning book, The Art of Partimento, which was published in 2012, which won the Wallace Berry Award from the Society of Music Theory. And today we will talk about his new book, The Piano Sonatas of Beethoven, which is published by Libreria Musicale Italiana. Professor Sanguinetti, welcome back to the show for the second time. Thank you, Nikhil. As you pointed out, this is my second time, as it's quite a record, isn't it? So yes. <laughs> uh, I'm really excited. It's an honor to be here again. Oh, the honor is all mine. The subject of your new book deals with the piano sonatas of Beethoven. Why did yes. you pick this subject? Well, uh, it's a part of a larger project. And uh, the Italian Musicological Society decided to... Um, honor Beethoven and to make a gift to Italian musician and pianist in particular and with a large uh, collection of five volumes on Beethoven 35 piano sonatas including also the three uh, sonata of the Bon time and um, with the help of the uh, Beethoven house in Bonn and uh, so there are five volumes, uh, and uh, mine was the first, and it's a general in, uh, it, it aims is to give a general landscape or an ecology for Beethoven piano sonatas, but I don't uh, speak about any specific piano sonata in depth. Um, the other four authors will speak um, about every single sonata, so in, in the more let's say, um, f- focused way on, on, on specific piano sonatas. So it's, a, it's a five volume work and uh, um, my, my volume my, is the first to come out. Right. And is this to coincide with the 250th birthday of Beethoven? Yes, of course. So, uh, wow, that's, that's really amazing. And can I ask, you are yourself a trained classical pianist. Did you play a lot of the Beethoven sonatas over the course of your career? I played many Beethoven piano sonatas, uh, and uh, but I, I can play all of them uh, except for Opus One or Six, not in public. So when I um, I wrote the preliminary version of this book and I used it for my own teaching at the University of Tor Vergata, and I promised my student. Okay, listen, if you take this course, I will play all Beethoven piano sonata for you, <laughs> except Opus 106. <laughs> it's just too difficult for me. And, uh, and so, I, yes, I, I did it, I, except maybe for the two small Opus 49 and some movement, but I, I did play all of them. Of course, the way, not, not the way a, a concert pianist do it, because I stopped doing concerts many years ago, so... Um, when I play, I, I try to um, to concentrate on music and on the musical meaning. Um, I'm not so very much worried about my slips of fingers anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it would be a great entry point to talk about the sonatas. First of all, how they're perceived uh, popularly, or oh, well, within the uh, the performance community and. It's very interesting in your book, you talk about the reverence we have for these sonatas, the, the hushed audience, the, the quiet of the entire auditorium, the pianist almost as a kind of a priest-like figure. And so it's very interesting. Let, let's talk about the sonatas. Were they published over his entire career, over the so-called three periods? What was the intended audience for these sonatas? And uh, yeah, let's really get into it. Yes, this is the beginning of the book. So I, I began the book describing the current way of um, enjoying a, a piano son, a classical piano sonata. So there's an audience sitting totally motionless in the dark and uh, watching a, a pianist dressed in black and playing a black uh, grand piano and uh, without the score on the stand and playing from memory in religious silence. So this is the, the, the current way we, we, um, we listen to um, Beethoven, not just Beethoven, piano sonata, but everything we, we, we call classical music. And that is, it was not the way they, they used to do at Beethoven's time. 
because um, you know the only Beethoven piano sonata performed during Beethoven's lifetime, uh, there was just one, and probably it was Opus 90. So it's it's, a, it's quite a small. It's a very beautiful sonata, of course, but quite a small one. It's not one of the big popular sonata. I don't know the Appassionata, the the Waldstein sonata. It's quite a small piece of music, and was performed by an amateur, so a, a liebhaber. Yeah. Yeah, so um, they use sonatas to for a private enjoyment uh, and for study and for um, in, in a very uh, restricted um, environment. So they, and, and very often they, the audience was the pianist himself or herself. So the, the people who listened to the music were usually the people who played the music. And this is one of the reasons because um, the so-called chamber music is more sophisticated than uh, orchestral music, symphonies, or concertos. Because symphony and concerto were devised for a larger audience. So the composer had to, to worry about the comprehensibility of this music, to, to reach a large amount of people, a large group of public, and not all of them were skilled musicians. But for chamber music and, and piano sonatas, or sonatas for a piano and another instrument, like violin or cello, um, they were written for skilled musicians. So they're more subtle in a way. And it, until now, so I mean, even now, if you, if you think of it, um, Beethoven's symphonies are much more popular than Beethoven's quartet. And because they were written this way. Did Beethoven himself perform these? Do we have accounts of him performing them? Or were they, like, for instance, the Moonlight Sonata was yes. popular in his time. So were people playing his scores? Was that a, a common thing? People were buying his sheet music and playing them privately? Yes, people uh, usually uh, bought um, piano sonatas for uh, private enjoyment and for study. And um, the problem with, is, um, with Beethoven, this, the problem is that he is at the crossroad of music history. So he, his culture is still the 18th century culture. So it thinks in 18th century terms, but the result is not anymore compatible to 18th century, not always compatible to 18th century way of experiences music. For example, um, Mozart or Haydn piano sonata were perfectly compatible to um, the technical level of most um, amateurs or, or dilettante player of his time. But if you think of Beethoven, not always later piano sonata, but some Beethoven very difficult piano sonata, they were far beyond the reach of every amateur, almost every amateur, because there was the Baroness um, who could play, a student of Beethoven who could play the Opus 101 very well. Um, so um, you, you ask me if Beethoven played uh, in public his piano sonatas. We have some evidence, some uh, written records of him playing, uh, but separate movement and not in public, uh, but in semi-private uh, occasions. So we have to distinguish when they played in, in public and when they, they played in some semi-public or semi-private audiences like the Salon of a noble family or aristocratic family. And uh, in this case, he sometimes he played some movement of, Beethoven, of his sonatas, but when he performed in public and um, like a, what they call the academia, so academia was like a uh, like a concert of today because there was people play, uh, paying the ticket, so buying the ticket for for uh, going in. And but it was uh, the the program of the academia is three or four times the the program of a current time. Um, recital and the uh, pianist never ever played uh, solo piano music in uh, in academia except for improvisation 
So they, they, if you look at the the academia, or academy of um, Beethoven held one of these academia in Vienna in the year one eight zero zero, and we have the program. So the academia begins with a a Mozart uh, symphony, and we don't know exactly which symphony it was, but probably it was the last symphony, the Jupiter, the, the great C major symphony. And then we, you have a unbelievable um, array of different kind of music. So you have a Haydn arias or um, ensemble from Haydn oratorios, the the Sep Beethoven's own septet. Um, Beethoven piano concerto, probably the first of seconds, and uh, at the end, first, Beethoven's first symphony. And the next to last number is Herr van Beethoven via the Fantasieren. So he will improvise. So this is a sp specific number. So it was the only time where pianists uh, sit at the piano without a written score on the stand. Because they 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 never played from memory, but they played always with the score. And the only time was that a score was not on the stand was when they improvised, and they improvised a lot. <laughs> and he was a great, very well known as a great improviser. And this is great. We are talking about the first part of your book, the the genre itself, the piano sonata. I think we laid it out quite well. Um, but I'd like to, before we move on to the next chapter, what is the paradigm shift that you mentioned about? The paradigm shift is uh, switching from a private uh, way of um, enjoying music to a status when the, um, the piece of music became a, a work of art and became unchangeable. And... Um, and since the work of art has become uh, unchangeable, that means that a large, uh, a, a kind of repertoire of canon of of um, uh, master works was established, and uh, consequently you cannot change it, and consequently improvisation dies out in in a few decades, and consequently uh, the performers becomes like um, um, interpreter, so we say we, we still use the word of interpreter. So a medium between the great composer and <laughs> the large audience is, is like a medium. <laughs> and so uh, Beethoven is at the at the center of this um, tectonic shift, we might say, because it really changed everything in the in music history. But Beethoven himself was still a 19th century musician. Um, so when, for example, when um, he had this great um, musician who was his pupil, Karcerny, and Karcerny, since his childhood, has an amazing musical memory, and he used to, to perform from memory all Beethoven piano sonatas. And Beethoven sometimes was there, and, uh, but he wasn't happy. Um, because for him, playing from memory was not just a way to maybe to, to, to induce or the audience believing that one is improvising, but in true is not improvising in playing someone else's music. So that also the most important thing for a pianist at the Beethoven's time was not playing perfectly from memory a piece of music, but uh, of course it was improvising but also uh, sight reading. So sight reading was so important for them. And Beethoven said, um, playing from memory can um, damage your sight reading. And was, why was that? that? Simply because there was no canon then. So new music, new music continued every, every week, almost every month, there was always new music. <clears throat> and uh, there was not an, an established... Um, um, deposit of masterworks to to repeat and to play again and again and again, like today. So today, pianists, most of concert pianists, they they spend their life playing always the same two or three dozen pieces, always them, but not at the time of Beethoven. Music was uh, always new, 
And so the, what was important was that if you if if someone played the, a, a, a new sonatas on your stand, you you had to be able to to play uh, at first sight. And this was much more important than any uh, perfect or uh, impeccable um, performance uh, like today. Today, trading is not even in, in for in, in in piano competition. Right. <laughs> it's so interesting. But could it be said that it could be the fault of the instrument? Because the instrument of those times were not that great enough. Now we have really fantastic instruments. So maybe to play one of these great scores would be better because we have such great instruments. And maybe Beethoven's pianos at the time were not good enough. What would you say to that? Uh, well, Beethoven was never happy with the pianos. And uh, differently from Mozart, who was perfectly happy with the Viennese pianos of his time, Beethoven was never happy. But he was never happy with French pianos like the Erard, was never happy with the English pianos, and uh, he, he was unsatisfied with the instruments. But we can say, um, what if Beethoven could hear, uh, listen to his music played on a Steinway or a Fazioli or a modern, a, a, a very expensive modern piano? Well, um, of course, we cannot tell his reaction, but w we can ask a very similar question. Uh, and the question is, um, does a modern piano um, render perfectly everything in Beethoven's piano sonata? And the answer is no, absolutely not. So a modern piano had very serious limitation regarding to um, the way Beethoven wrote his music. And uh, so uh, sometimes it's even impossible on a modern piano to um, to play um, ver to play Beethoven music as it's written. For example, um, the beginning of uh, of the Waldstein Sonata is so rhythmic, and you need a uh, a damper that stops immediately the string a fraction of second, a millisecond after the hammer. Uh, strikes and this was possible on um, the so-called forte pianos or, or the pianoforte of Beethoven time, but it's not possible on a modern piano because the the strings are so big, are so long, and and there are crossed strings um, running above, so and they're vibrating for sympathy. So it's not possible. There's many many other examples. Uh, just to mention one, he, uh, at the beginning of the pathetic, uh, the pathetic sonata, he, he writes a, a, a very strong uh, C minor chord, and he writes forte piano. So he wants that this, the chord immediately after uh, the uh, strikes in forte in, is in in two seconds. Um, the, the sonority dwindles to piano, and that was possible on his instrument. But in a modern piano, you know how how <laughs> how long it takes. I, I counted it; it's almost fifteen seconds. So you cannot play fifteen seconds on a C minor chord. No, you cannot. It's out of musical musical. Uh, logic. I have two quick questions before we move on to the big topic of form. Um, well, just a personal question, uh, since this is very this show is geared to music education. How would you recommend somebody get better at sight reading? Oh, reading, reading, reading. Uh, I mean, I, I I always been a good sight reader, and I remember when I was a, a young student <clears throat> at the Conservatory of Parma, and um, there was a good library. So I borrowed all mm, piano music by Schumann, and so when I was 15, I think, I read all Schumann piano music at uh, first sight. And I did the same with, uh, with all other great uh, composers. So it just, of course, it's not, not everybody is given by good sight reading, but you can develop it very well, just by habit. But of course, if you always play the same pieces over and over and over, you will never develop a good sight reading. Okay. I don't think there are methods in any... Uh, so just, just, just do it. Just do, do it. it. Okay. And uh, one final question is Beethoven's playing style. So what can we say about how he would have played his sonatas? Yeah. Um, 
this is a very, very um, interesting question. It's related to what we, was, we were saying uh, before about the piano. So um, um, I, I will do an example. The, the problem of um, legato versus non legato versus parlante. Uh, touch. So at the time of Beethoven was very famous for his legato touch, and legato um, means that um, you 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 don't have to articulate the the notes, but every note flows into the next one. And um, but at Beethoven time, it was also a, a very important style of playing that was the parlante style. So um, in other words. Um, the legato is an imitation of singing, but the parlante is an imitation of the speaking. So uh, the, the idea is that the piano is speaking, not singing. And of course, when you make the piano sound like it's, it's speaking, you have to use very short slurs. You have to, show, to use a non legato touch. You, you have to use some staccato. So it's very subtle. And... Um, um, Beethoven uh, used both, and uh, if, for example, in the Largo Mesto of, of a Sonata Opus uh, 10, number 3, the D major sonata, uh, is a D minor piece, it's very famous, and uh, it, there's an alternation of um, legato and, uh, and parlante style, and uh, the... the if, Perhaps the legato is, is kind of imitation of, you know, uh, you can in, in, interpret this in um, like the parlato is the mass of the orchestra and the parlante is the individual. So it's kind of uh, hermeneutics uh, uh, contraposition between the, 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 the mass and the individual. Uh, so he used both because the it's always the same thing. So Beethoven is in the middle. He, he caused a change and he was in the middle of a huge um, shift in the music history. And this shift was uh, provoked by Beethoven himself. <laughs> <laughs> so it was the cause and the effect at the same time. Okay. Now we get into a very big topic, which is uh, writing and form. And uh, actually, before we get into Beethoven's form himself, I've always wanted to ask you, in, with regard to the Italians and Parlamento and the 18th century, how did they teach form in the Neapolitan conservatories? Or did they even talk about form? Um, not that I'm, I'm aware of. Um, I think that form can... Um, uh, could be transmitted through maybe through partimento, but probably more through the solfeggio. Um, uh, but we don't have, except for some very late and um, uh, mid uh, 19th century, just a mid 19th century treatise. Um, but no, we don't have a, anything written on form. We don't have treatises on form from the Neapolitan tradition um, because everything was taught um, um, orally, so they didn't need it. Now we go to the German side and there are quite a number of theorists, particularly in the middle of the 18th century, Riepel, and moving on to Koch and, yeah. and, and uh, these people. You, know, you mentioned yes. Beethoven was kind of an 18th century figure. And before we go into the 19th century commentators who talked about his form, how would, you, how would he have thought about the form of his when he was writing his piano sonatas? Well, this is an interesting question. Um, um, I can imagine Beethoven being asked about um, piano sonata and the answer what? Um, but I don't think it's exactly this way Um, uh, we have some notes jotted into his um, uh, sketchbooks and uh, William Drapkin worked this is is a paper of William Drapkin on this and he looked through the sketchbook of Beethoven and they found some abbreviation like M.G. And that the probably is middle gedanke or middle ideas. So what we call the second scene. And but it's just hints. Uh, and um, 
But this was an idea I followed when I, I planned the chapter on, on the history of musical form, because, you know, the, the current, the, the, um, the scholastic form of idea of musical form was based on the German form and Lehre, and the German form and Lehre originated in, in Lipsia in the second half of the uh, 19th century. Um, but it, it was quite remote from the, um, removed from the uh, original um, uh, cultural environment of Beethoven. So I decided to concentrate on three um, main figures that revolved in some ways around Beethoven for what concerned the um, musical form. So, and the figure were uh, Anton Reicha, uh, Carcerni and um, Adolf Bernard Marx. So Reicha was a, a pal of Beethoven. <laughs> was they, they were born in the same year as 1770, and uh, they um, studied with the same teacher, uh, I think that both studied with Neife, uh, and they played in the same orchestra in Bonn, and they were very, very close friends. So at a certain point, um, Beethoven and Reicha had some argument about variation, about the art of variation, about um, when Reicha wrote the treatise on fugue and Beethoven didn't like it. Um, so the, the friendness um, broke some way, but it, it was very close to Beethoven. And it became a very important teacher at the Conservatoire de Paris, and he wrote a treatise on, on form. So the idea of Reicha on, for, on sonata form uh, are extremely important because it was so close to Beethoven. And Carcerni wrote also a, a, a treatise on composition, and it was Beethoven's um, most important um, student of Pobel. And other Bernard Marx, I don't think that Beethoven and Marx never ever met. But Marx was uh, a, a young man in, in Berlin, and uh, he started um, publishing articles on Beethoven in his journal. Uh, it was called the Berliner Allgemeine Musikalische Zeitung, so the um, Berlin um, General Music um, uh, Magazine. And the publisher, who was also a publisher of Beethoven late piano sonata, sent um, an entire um, year of, um, of, of this uh, journal to Beethoven. It was the year 1824, and uh, Beethoven wrote back and say, oh, I like very much what uh, Mr. Marx is writing. He's clearly one uh, person who understand music very well. Uh, okay, this is uh, this is interesting because I am fam a little familiar with, with uh, Adolf Bernhard Marx from a previous interview uh, with uh, Professor Johannes Menke and they talked, and Marx, he, the way I picture Marx, he's is a radical, he wants to have a new way of theory and so it's very interesting that in your book you talk about that uh, Beethoven liking Marx's commentaries on his music. Yes, he did. And of course, Beethoven couldn't uh, have known um, Marx's later um, treatise of music because it was published on, I think, 1854. Um, but the idea was still there. And uh, yes, Beth Marx was a radical thinker and was a. Um, but he, he found himself in a very in a very strange situation because. Um, uh, you know that Marx accepted the position in the um, Humboldt Universität in, in Berlin, the, the, the Humboldt University, a position in music, musicology. And it was the first time that a musician ever uh, got a position in a university uh, after the Middle Ages, of course. Wow. And but there weren't even musicians, <laughs> by the way. Uh, and so um, the, the position was offered to Mendelssohn, but he refused and recommended Marx in his place, and he accepted. So Marx found himself teaching um, composition or music theory to a large audience of very wealthy and very well-born uh, young German um, students 
who were at the same time student was people like Schleiermacher or Hegel. So you can imagine uh, if you teach music music theory or music composition to students who just came out of a class with Hegel, <laughs> just intimidating. So he had to find out a way to communicate um, musical ideas or musical theory in a way that was compatible to um, the, the authority and the glamour of uh, Hegel. So he couldn't teach the, the same way Music has always been taught like an apprenticeship, like uh, like a like a trade, like a craft, because it was the humble university, for God's sake. So <laughs> you have to do it a very very sophisticated way. So he found this theory, but this theory is the very, is, is extremely valuable, and I, I and it's very it was very influential. So you can find traces of Marx. Uh, thinking in all the history of music um, of musical form, including uh, William Kaplan. Right, that's interesting. And uh, so the seeds of this were in older things, and you, uh, but, but isn't it true that he himself, he did it because he wanted to do it? He really wanted to change the, the way we thought of music theory, and he wanted to abandon the ancient regime. Yes, of course, he had to do, and he was immersed in a, in a, a there are also political, political reasons for that, because at the time, uh, Berlin was probably the only stronghold of German, of, um, of German music, I mean, not influenced by Italian opera, because all, the rest of, of German-speaking uh, world was completely mad for, for <laughs> cre- they were creative for Rossini and for Italian opera. Vienna was totally uh, lying at the feet of Rossini. And the only stronghold that resisted was Berlin. <laughs> so it was politically important to keep Berlin German. And uh, so he created a, a religion of music based on Beethoven. That was a, a political uh, project also. Politically, what was Beethoven? Um, well, well, he, he studied, uh, he, he took some lessons at the University of Bonn when he was young, uh, with Reich, I think. And Bonn was very much influenced by um, uh, French Enlightenment. So his idea were, uh, it was a democratic, uh, it was a liberal. We, we might say today, Beethoven was certainly a liberal. And, uh, but at the same time, um, we, we, we don't have to get fueled by this idea of a, a radical liberal Beethoven who never wanted to be supported by anyone who was a, a freelance composer. And no, he always accepted the help of aristocracy. He, he, he could, he invented the figure of the self-sustaining composer of the individual, uh, of the uh, freelance composer, you know, the, the artist who, who could live out of his um, creation. But this is what the truth. He himself, he relied heavily on the support of the aristocracy. He wasn't at the service of the aristocracy. That's true. He never served as a, a, as a court musician. But um the uh, the great aristocratic families in Vienna they paid him uh, uh, a large amount of money just to live in Vienna he, at a certain point they said well you know say, you know what I'm going to castle and they said no no you stay here and we we, we give you money to, <laughs> just to make sure that you stay in Vienna <laughs> <laughs> okay so can you talk about the rise of Foreman Lehrer and the criticism and the so-called decline of it well, a formulary uh, originated clearly from, uh, there were two, two main currents of formulary in Germany. <clears throat> One was the Berlin tradition, more sophisticated, more intellectual, we can say. And the other one was the Leipzig tradition, which more was more oriented on practical teaching in the conservatory. You know that the, the Leipzig conservatory was the, um, the first conservatory in Germany and uh, was founded, I think, in 1842 by Mendelssohn. So um, quite late, um, uh, you know, um, it, I think it was half a century later than the Conservatory of Paris, not to mention the Napolitan Conservatory, of course. So, and um, 
the Conservatory of Leipzig, um, um, the f they focused on the, in the invention of the modern, so the, the, the current way of thinking as a performer. Um, so they, they invented, the, for example, the distinction between the um, technique and Vortrag. So the technique and musicality, we might call it now. Or well, is is a technical musician, pianist, but is not so musical. Well, this was invented in Leipzig at that time, and um, so everything was, and and the distinction between a performer, a pianist, and a composer, uh, they divided the two figures, so the pianist and the composer. So a pianist could not be, they were frowned upon if the pianist wanted to join a composition class and wow. vice versa. Because a pianist, a pianist had to be a, just a pianist and the composer was an entirely different beast. And so the, the, the formulary was created, the Leipzig formulary was created to, uh, to support um, the student of um, performing students, especially pianists and the composition students, uh, for the the, um, the the course of study, um, they, the Leipzig formula was so uh, fantastically successful, also because Leipzig was the capital of modern um, publishing industry. Uh, so the, all, all the great um, musical printing houses were based in Leipzig, and some of them are still existing: in Peters, Breitkopf, and Hertel and uh, the um, Eulenburg, they still exist, and they were uh, founded in, in Leipzig at that time, and they, they were also fantastic uh, technological development, like for example, the, the, the application of, the, um, of a particularly technique of printing to musical printing that uh, causes the prices of music to, to, to go dramatically uh, down. So um, they, they and, and um, at a certain point, the the great uh, Leipzig uh, publisher, they even published themselves translation of their formulary treatises in other languages. So they published the tr Italian translation of uh, treatises on harmony and form directly because they are a, an incredible uh, force <laughs> on the map. Right, right. You, you mentioned it was a fantastically popular, but there was some criticism of it. The, the Formulera? Formulera, uh, um, well, Formulera was popular and was basically the only, um, you might say, um, academic theory of music taught um, until the early 20th century. So when serious criticism began, and because they, uh, music, music, many musicians of the time realized that there was a huge hiatus between what the formula says that the sonata had to be and the actual piano sonatas. So they were totally different, or at least very different. So that's when serious criticism began, and one of the most uh, severe critics uh, was, of course, Heinrich Schenker, uh, who f deeply felt this um, um, insufficiency of, of form and lyric. And but the same idea was shared by many other um, musicians of the time, like Schoenberg, for example. So this is not satisfaction with uh, the traditional formula continued um, until and, and they reached the 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 deepest point I think in the um, 1970s probably 1960s when formula was in, when yeah, American for example American music theory. Uh, it, it was the time of the rise of, of the academic American music theory, but formula was not considered uh, because it was just a thing for student, for um, undergraduate students and for conservatory students. Um, but that changed, right? Because in around 1960, Edward T. Cohn talked about yes. the Sonata Principle. The Sonata Principle, of course, there was, a, but it was a small book, not a textbook. 
And then uh, Charles Rosen wrote some very interesting thing about it, and especially Leonard Ratner. And his, I find Ratner's idea of the point of furthest remove in the development of Sonata extremely interesting. And, uh, but things really changed at the end, the turn of the century, uh, when the two, for some reason, opposing theories of uh, William Kaplan and Depokowski Darcy came out uh, more or less at the same time. So we had from nothing, we had <laughs> two highly developed and extremely interesting theory, uh, uh, one opposed to, to the other. If you and could, for my book, audience, could you uh, mention what makes them diametrically opposed and what are the important features of both, who are maybe not familiar with form? Well, uh, basically, um, Kaplan's theory is a, is a development of um, Schoenberg ideas motivated to Erwin Rath, uh, Einführung in the Formulary. Uh, Rath was a student of Schenker, uh, of, I'm sorry, of student of Schoenberg, and he published this book, which not, was not translated into English, it's still in German. And um, um, a very interesting book about musical form, very radical change um, um, in comparison to traditional form and theory. And um, uh, William Kaplan developed his theory from the starting point of, she of Schoenberg and Rath. I think the most important contribution of of Kaplan is, uh, first of all, the idea that uh, harmony is integrated with form and is very, is very clear about that. And then the fact that in, he abandons the, the, the greatest threat, the greatest danger of um, traditional formal layer, which is a taxonomic approach. So the idea that you, you had to attach labels to every phrase, to every uh, theme, to every part right. of the, <laughs> oh, and, and Kaplan focuses on function and uh, and this is a radical change so not what is it but how does it work so what is its function in the general uh, shape of the in the general form of the music and I think that this is extremely important change and it works very well in my in my experience I've taught several years of um, several times um, I gave courses on musical form and I've been using many times um, Kaplan's book and uh, all students are extremely happy with that, with, with this approach. Now, what about yeah, Hepakowski and Darcy? Hepakowski and Darcy is extremely interesting too. Is in my opinion, well, they're more, more um, grounded on, on Schenker approach. I think, because some of the uh, really big ideas in Epokowski and Darcy are compatible with Schenker. So, for example, the, um, the um, essential exponential closure or the essential sonata closure is basically is where the uh, Urlinie had an interruption or where the Urlinie closes at the end of the piece. So this is it basically is the same thing. And um, uh, there are something extremely appealing in Epokowski and Darcy, but also controversial. So they say they, I, I can explain you uh, with, with an example, the development. So for, for Kaplan, a development in the Sonata form, um, as a, it, it follows uh, Ratz in this idea of the Kern der Durchführung, so the, the, the core of the development. So in Beethoven, for example, this is very clear, not in all other uh, composers of the classical era, but in Beethoven is very clear. So uh, in, in more, more or less in the middle of the development, you have a, a sequence, so you have a four or eight bar phrase uh, transposed by um, the sending fifth chain for two or three times. Then you have something happened before, so the pre-core, and which is a, a sort of preparation of the core, and a post-core, and then a standing on the dominant. So the, according to, to Kaplan, a, a development is something very specific and very different from the, uh, the um, 
uh, the exposition and the, the uh, and the recapitulation. Um, and Bukowski and Darcy, they, they take a totally different approach. So they see the sonata as a rotation of the same material that goes through and through for three or four times, and uh, more or less in the same order. So we have the first rotation is the exposition, and then you have the, the, the ideas, the musical ideas, rotating through a certain order. And these this ideas rotate again in the, um, in the um, recapitulation, and they rotate also in the development. So a development is a, 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 a rotation of the same material, maybe with a darker mood or in, 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 in a slightly um, different order, but not too, not too different because you have to preserve the idea of rotation. So they don't have a specific theory for the development because the development is just the second rotation of the of the sonata cycle. Very interesting, and this is just a taste of it. It's a really tremendous book, very lots packed with detail. So let's move to the third area now, which is expression. And this is interesting. Now we talk about you mentioned hermeneutics before. Um, let's let's refer to Beethoven's sonatas as an object of inve- with the with an investigation of hermeneutics. Well, hermeneutic is a, it has the same story as uh, formal lyre. So hermeneutic was extremely popular in the 18th century, uh, uh, sorry, in the 19th century, and um, was the most common approach for explaining Beethoven music uh, to the general audience. Uh, serious musicians often complained about that. Uh, Schenker hated hermeneutics, <laughs> even though even though he used hermeneutics in his analysis. So it's a kind of disguised, disguised hermeneutics, <laughs> some of that. But uh, hermeneutics um, had some, some really good points about hermeneutics. I mean, um, n- nobody felt the need of hermeneutics for Haydn music, for Haydn or Mozart or Bucherini's or Clementi's music, I mean, at least not in this way. But at a certain point, the musician or the audience felt the need or hermeneutic, the explanation. Why Beethoven music is so weird? Why is it strange? <laughs> Why is it different from other music? There must be a reason. So they try to find the reason in this, in in everything. I mean, if you read uh, um, some book of hermeneutics in the 18th century, uh, you find comparison between Beethoven sonatas and um, you mean the 19th century, or, right? Oh, the Asagi, I'm sorry. Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. in the 18th century, because they I'm, were not talking yeah, about hermeneutics, I, hermeneutics, right? Yeah, I, I, I think Ottocento in my head. Okay. <laughs> Automatically. <laughs> yeah, automatically. <laughs> translating the 18th century, but of course, okay. the 19th century. I have to add one, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, so everything, so from a, a book or a play or a Shakespeare play or a painting or even... Um, a shipwreck <laughs> could be, called. yeah. The, for the, the the Medusa shipwreck occurred in France, in, in Senegal. In 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 uh, it was a French ship that shipwrecked in 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 Africa, and uh, there was a terrible story. So he compared this this, this uh, event with uh, I think it was Beethoven Opus One of Six, of course. Right, right. <laughs> and so and. and this was so popular that, of course, the, 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 it declined almost at the same time of the decline of formal era, when music, music analysis um, rose as an independent, um, independent branch of music theory. So what, what, what and, um, but it has been revived. too, like, like uh, music, um, like formal era has been revived uh, by especially by, by Kapin and Epokowski Darcy. Um, musical hermeneutics being read by Robert Hatton, who wrote two fascinating books, among others, on Beethoven and uh, this new hermeneutics approach. And then there is, of course, the, the topic theory, which is an entirely different thing. 
Okay, before we jump into topic theory, is it? I, I'm interested in this. You mentioned that n- the audiences were, didn't really need to apply hermeneutics to Mozart, Haydn, and the previous uh, generation. Is that is that maybe perhaps due to the rising secularism of the the Romantic era, of the 19th century, and we wanted to use more humanist and secular images to describe things and dis- to describe the music, and whereas maybe you could. I guess in a very general sense, talk about the 18th century. Everyone was kind of a devout Catholic or Lutheran, and so it's kind of all settled in that way, in that image. Uh, is, there, is, is, is religion a part of it in some way? Oh, religion played a role in the new image of the performers, and I speak about that in the last part of the book. I don't think that religion plays a role in this. Maybe um, the growing... Uh, idea that music is part of the general of the Beaux-Arts or the general culture um, and um, musical work can be compared to the great works of literature of, of paintings of um, architecture so this, this is a it's a way of grow and my manifestation of a growing status of music which right, right from the, the, the previous, uh, music was a commodity before, no? And music rose from commodity to, uh, to the status of work of art, of gay culture, right at the times of Beethoven. Fantastic. Now, I interrupted you. You were about to talk about topic theory, and I really want to hear about that. Um, topic theory um, plays some important role in Beethoven piano sonata, maybe not as important as for Mozart, uh, because I think that Beethoven was removed from the world of musical signals and dances, and chord dances, and, um, um, you know, the, all, the, all that um, sound landscape that um, was so important at the time of Mozart or Haydn, at the time of Beethoven, it was... Uh, for, for example, take the dances, uh, chord dances. Um, they were, they are everywhere in Mozart music, but not so in Beethoven. And nevertheless, Beethoven still has very, uh, very clear topics in his music. So the horn fifths at the beginning of uh, Beethoven Les Adieux, uh, the farewell sonata, are clearly a, a continuation of a history of the sign that started in the uh, 16th century when uh, when the noble family, a very rich family in France, started to use um, the horns as a way of communication between, of communicating between uh, squads of hunters in, in the forest. You know, they hunted the, um, uh, the deer and uh, it was so such an expensive thing that they hunted deer for spending like a war. There's a, a fascinating book of Monel on this. And uh, so this the hearing for, for people living in small villages or in small towns close to the forest, you know, hearing the, the um, uh, horn fifth was, was related to distance, to nature, to the feeling of something removed and something uh, uh, not familiar. So then this meaning uh, was um, continued when the horn went into the orchestra and uh, was used in um, as a topic to communicate the feeling of um, of distance, of uh, extraneation, of uh, um, being uh, alone or being uh, in a forest. So Beethoven used the topic of the Horn Fifth uh, at the beginning of, Beto- of the uh, Les Adieux Sonata because it says, like, this sonata is about parting. So, and parting is expressed in this way. Oh, actually, uh, Giorgio, did he, did he write explanations about his sonatas? Like, this sonata is about this, that's about that. Did he ever do that? No, this is a characteristic sonata, like sonata characteristic, like the, the, 
the the pathetic sonata. It, it was a subgenre of a sonata, so, so a characteristic. But more interesting is the 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 problem of the the so-called moonlight sonata. The moonlight right. Sonata is, he, uh, he did not name of, it that, right? No, of course not. That's the moonlight sonata. <laughs> Um, the, the, the nickname Moonlight Sonata has been uh, considered a, like an anathema for many serious musicians because, <laughs> oh no, it's just, you know, this terrible thing that they name this Sonata quasi una fantasia. Moonlight has nothing to do with Moonlight, it was just an invention. Well, actually, it was not. Uh, and there's a, an, an interesting um, article published by um, Sarah Waltz. In a few years ago, and she shows that um, the Moonlight Sonata is a, a manifestation of a complex of myths surrounding the idea of a night, of moon, of solitude, of nature that existed before the sonata, and that probably Beethoven was aware of the name and had nothing to, to complain about it. So it's not authentic, but probably Beethoven knew about this thing and sort of not disagreed with it. <laughs> right. Okay. Let's dash a little bit about archetypes, schemas, and and uh, specimens. And and schema. That's a something that has been popularized with Robert Yerdigan, Vasily Biros. Do we see his schematic archetypes? Can we see them in his? Does Beethoven employ them in his uh, yes. piano sonatas? Yes, he is employed in, not just in piano sonata, but in, in general in his music. And uh, he used a schemata, or what I call um, tonal archetype, because this is not a name for this theory, so it's called the new theory. Um, and part of this theory are schemata, partimenti, partitura, and um, a lot of things. So you know, what German called the Satzmodelle theory. And... Um, Beethoven used in in the first period uh, just uh, as much as any other composer would at the time, especially in in the genre uh, for the larger audiences. For example, in the piano concertos, the, the first two piano concertos. If you look at the solos at the opening solo of, of first piano concerto, is almost is entirely made with the um, building blocks. So and I list them bar for bar. So and it, it's really it's really amazing. Um, the so-called um, the so-called heroic period or middle period. Well, he, either he transformed the part of the tonal archetypes in almost unrecognizable way, and uh, for example, the the the, the Romanesca in the Wallstein sonata. Or used for non-thematic um, um, section. For example, in Fifth Symphony, there's a very clear sequence: of seven, six, uh, seven, six, eight, seven, six, eight, seven, six, eight. Uh, but it's not part of the main theme. Um, in in the end, what I find really fascinating is that at the end of his career, so the so-called third period, he picked up again the old schemata and the old rule of the octave and the old Romanesca and this old stuff. And But this time he never tried to hide it, to, to conceal it in any way as it did before in, in the so-called second period. But they are there on the surface, exposed, completely exposed. And... I think very fascinating that uh, the great German philosopher Adorno, he um, said that Beethoven, in the last period, he let the music speak for itself. So um, it's not anymore the, the voice of the composer, the ego of the composer speaking, but the music tradition, the music convention, the musical grammar itself is speaking, but he couldn't identify exactly how that happened, because at the time there was no knowledge of the SAS model or the, the schemata or the thing. So it's just an idea. Now we can see that Beethoven used the Romanesca, for example, or the rule of the octave or other um, schemata with this um, 
um, as a topics of innocence and uh, and happiness. And this is very clear. It's very clear in, in, for example, in the in the middle section of the um, of the canzone di ringraziamento, in one of the last quartet. And this is a, the and this is a dance in the middle in the major. And this is a Romanesca Galante. So so clear, so clearly exposed, and there was no and is um, of course the the meaning is it became a topic for. For innocence and from the return to um, a natural status. That's really fascinating. Now, let's touch a little bit on historically informed performance. Let's talk about, first of all, the, the metronome markings. I mean, were they for real? I mean, were you supposed to play the Hammer Clavier that fast? Oh, the marking, yes. We have just one uh, authentic metronome marking in Beethoven, is the, the Opus 106. Uh, but we have. Um, Five series of markings, almost complete, I think, uh, from uh, Cherny, and um, a lot more from um, um, Moscheles. Um, the Opus 106 is the only marking uh, of Beethoven, and it is a one a three eight a, um, a half note. Most never, uh, I think, the only pianist who played it in this way is on the recording is Schnabel. But it clearly is extremely, um, it's not a disc keeping this time. All other pianists, uh, even technically extremely gifted pianists, they don't dare to play this time. But I listened to a forte pianist, I don't remember his name, I'm very sorry, uh, who played the first movement exactly with this metronome and is amazing. I mean, it, you, you feel that this is the right tempo. Really? Okay. Um, so, yeah, because I think that um, by writing this tempo, he did, Beethoven didn't want to, to give the, he, he wanted to tell the performer, listen, you don't have to play this beginning like um, in a monumental way. It is to be catastrophic. Okay. <laughs> it, it, it is like a, a storm hitting you in the head. <laughs> and after that, you, of course, Beethoven, well, we, we can be quite sure that Beethoven intended the metronome in a, in a general, not, not just for the whole movement, especially when it's so large and so diverse and so complex, but it's just the beginning. So the, the, the ba-bam, 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 must be something terrifying. And then you can slow down, of course, in, in the cantabular sections. This brings me to Werk Troyer, the faithfulness to the intentions of the composer and well, let's talk about that and I, I believe there was a very very interesting line by Cherny that you, you put in the book which tells the performer to respect the the score well Cherny um, he, he writes in in the um, um, true art of performing Beethoven piano music you know and um, uh, this this story that um, he was performing a farewell concert for a couple of friends of musicians who left Vienna, that were supposed to leave Vienna the next day, the, the day after. And he was playing, a, I think, a quintet, of Beethoven quintet, and with other um, colleagues. And uh, he improvised, he changed. I mean, what I think that he did was everything else did. So changed the, 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 the octave, um, uh, in, played more brilliant passages, and so did the things. Beethoven was mad at <laughs> And he made the scene in front of the audience, of the other, and uh, this scene must have been so terrible that he wrote uh, the day after a letter to Cherny apologizing. <laughs> you can imagine Beethoven apologizing is quite a weird thing, you know. And Cherny was so shocked that he wrote, never ever change the music as is written in bold. <laughs> but, but I think that that happened because they, everybody did it. So it was a common thing. And probably, and Beethoven did the same. And allowed other people to do the same. There's a famous episode when um, he played with um, Bridge Tower 
you know, the, the true delicatarian of uh, Opus uh, 47 violin sonata. For the first time, the sonata was bridge tower. And um, uh, if you know the beginning of the sonata, the piano has a, a, a wonderful um, uh, arpeggio, like cadenza-like arpeggio in C major. And the violin has nothing. So you imagine um, um, uh, bridge tower, so Beethoven playing this wonderful flourish, and they say, well, I want to do the same thing. <laughs> and he played the same thing with the violin. Beethoven was a, unbelievably happy. So Beethoven bent out and embraced him and uh, said, do it again. <laughs> That's not quite like no. what happened with Cherny. <laughs> no, but Cherny was a student of okay? Yeah. And uh, so he didn't, but uh, Cherny was a student and Bridgetower was his peer. That's probably one of the reasons. So can you comment on uh, Vert Troyer in the modern age now, in 2020 going to 2021? Should performers honor the score to the note? Um, For Beethoven, this is a difficult question. Um, Beethoven wrote many notes and didn't like, it didn't do as Mozart that uh, who left many blank passages in the piano concertos. The Beethoven sonata are uh, almost completely written out, but not entirely. So there are still places where you can add, um, for example, the, 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 the corona. You can perform an eingang or you can perform a small cadence or you can improvise something. Um, there are places when you can do it and um, uh, some forte piano player like Robert Levin, they do it. And uh, I think they also, uh, Malcolm Bilson uh, showed in there's some um, videos on YouTube where he speaks about that. So yes, definitely you can do something. Um, not much as with Mozart Piano Concerto, but you can do something, I think. Well, it's been a thoroughly enjoyable conversation. I mean, to my dear listeners, please check out this phenomenal book by Professor Giorgio Sanguinetti. It is written in Italian, and uh, the title is La Sonata per Pianoforte di Beethoven, Genera, Forma, Espressione. And honestly, what a great opportunity for us to work on our Italian, right? I'll have the link for the book in the description. Now, Professor Sanguinetti, it would be I would get a lot of heat from people if I didn't ask you any questions about Partimento. And so you got him on the show, you didn't ask him anything about Partimento. And now that we know that Partimento is getting so popular, something like 2000 people joining the Art of Partimento group on Facebook over the last year. Let's talk about 2021. What what do you think is in store? How do you feel about the surge of interest in Partimento? Uh amazed that uh, I, I didn't expect anything like that, sincerely, and uh, I, I'm really made and very happy about this. And uh, but I can tell you one thing, and I'm working on a revision of my book, so um, I think that in in a year or a so, couple of year maximum, this will be a new edition of book with, of my book with um, um, when I give um, account of the. Uh, new thing that happened in, in the field. So new researches, new, new findings, new manuscript, and uh, a lot of, lot of things happened since uh, two, um, 2010, when I finished working at it. And uh, it is 10 years of um, surge of interest in Partimento that still, uh, and I, will, I, I plan to account for them in, in the new edition of my book. Wonderful. Uh, let me, can I ask, if you have a bit of time, can I ask you a couple more questions along this, Partimento? Of course. A lot of people are finding about Partimento. There's many, they, they come into it from many different ways. Maybe Robert Yertigan, your book, they see realizations on YouTube. They all have a similar question. How do I learn this? Like, what's the, what's the best way for me to learn Partimento? Can you give some advice on how all these new people who are coming in, how should they start? Well, you you have learned a lot already because I, I I've seen your videos on YouTube where you, you're doing a fantastic realization of Partimento. So <laughs> you don't need to learn. <laughs> Grazie. <laughs> but yes, I, the, the the traditional way was to use a uh, to learn from a teacher, and uh, this is I think still the best option. 
Um, I just hope that there will be more and more courses on Partimento in, in conservatories and in music school around the world. And some uh, already there are. I mean, there is even a cons- Partimento conservatory in Louisiana. Can you imagine? I don't know if you know it, but <laughs> yeah. there it is. So, <laughs> so, and um, I hope that more and more there will be. In the meanwhile, there are books and uh, uh, online resources and... Um, and the, the Art of Partimento Facebook page. Um, and if, if, you, if someone has any doubt on his realization, he, can, he or her can post um, the realization on the, the, on the, on the page and, and just read the comments of, of the very knowledgeable people that um, is in this page. Now, uh, some people start with Forno, some people start with Feneroli, Durante, Insanguini. Is there a certain set of Partimenti that you recommend people start with? Well, I, I know that someone, uh, m- many colleagues of mine use Forno. Um, I prefer to use, um, or, or I haven't seen a, a Partimento realization or in a German, um, a German town, a northern German town using Insanguini, which is quite difficult in my opinion. Uh, but they told me that it was not the first attempt, so it's okay. Um, I personally, I think that Fenerole is still the best uh, way to to start with Partimenti. So Fenerole first book, and ah, of course, a, a very good um, approach is also Handel, you know, Handel exercises for Princess Anne. Uh, it's, it's a completely different approach, it's more German because and that uses the uh, separate chords, um, uh, use it, um, um, it thinks in quarter, not in quarter term, but uh, I mean, there are exercises for six, five chord, exercise for two, six, and uh, it's not based on the rule of the author exactly, but it's very, very uh, good and, and, and very gradual approach, perhaps more gradual than the Fenerole. So if you don't, if you know nothing about, um, um, continue playing, uh, probably handle will be better because you start, you know, connecting triads in root position. And you 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 start to learn the three years of connecting triads. You know, the bass moving by fifth or by third or by step, and so you start connecting uh, triads in root position triads in this way, and uh, which is easier probably that starting with the cadence or the rule of the octave. The, the next question is, let's say you are quite well ahead in Partimento and you're, do, you're pretty comfortable doing realizations. Now you want to get into written counterpoint like the Neapolitans did. What is your advice? Because I know you're composition trained yourself. You are also very well trained in counterpoint. How should somebody start learning counterpoint, the written kind? Should they do Fuchs? Should they look at the old counterpoint manuscripts of the Neapolitan conservatory students? What's the best way to learn counterpoint? Well, when I teach counterpoint, I use Fuchs. Um, Fuchs was not opposed to, to Neapolitan teaching because they are... Uh, um, I, I looked into the library of the, of the Conservatory of Naples and there was a copy of the original uh, edition of Fuchs, the Latin edition, not the Italian edition, the Latin edition. So, and uh, Fuchs was held in high esteem by Neapolitan teachers. So I think that it's, it's okay to use Fuchs. For, uh, I mean, right, right now, I finished my course, teaching my course in Species Counterpoint with my students here in Rome and Tor Vergata. Um, and I used Fuchs, uh, Fuchs and approach, or through Salter Schachter. Some people are always saying, this Partimento is great, it's very interesting, I really see how historically interesting and useful it is, but can it be useful for me in the modern age? And I actually notice humorously some people in the Art of Partimento Facebook group are posting popular songs that have uh, progressions that we can identify with Partimento theory and schema theory. Do you think that in contemporary music, uh, if we move beyond the 18th century into the 19th, even contemporary music and all these things, is this understanding of Partimento theory, can it form an interesting foundation for looking at other later styles of music perhaps? I think we can distinguish between partimento and related theories and 
partimentals and Vincent of teaching. So partimental and related theory are based on uh, building blocks or schemata. And of course, you can find building blocks in in all tonal music. And I, I don't know about post uh, a tonal music. I don't think so. <laughs> no, let's not talk about that. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I know. popular music. Of course, you can. Um, so the answer is yes. Uh, the other question is, or the other way of um, answering to your question is more complicated. So, can is 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 possible? Is it possible that an approach like partimento, so improvising over a bass, basically with some hints at the other voices? could be done in style different than 18th century style. Um, I did it. Um, when I, I taught in, a few years ago in, in, at McGill University in Montreal, in Canada, so I, I composed a partimento in the style of a Fourier waltz impromptu. So late, uh, late um, 19th century French music. And I can tell you it works. So you, you can do it. So no, 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 no question. As far as the uh, music is tonal and you can uh, write a bass line with some hints and the other voices if you want maybe and ask students to, uh, to complete it or to improvise it uh, at the keyboard. So yes, but there's no repertoire still. So I think that to someone, someone you can imagine writing a collection of partimenti in, in 19th century style. This can certainly be done. So in, in, there are exist actually um, partimenti in 19th century style. And there's a paper of Gaetano Stella on journal of music theory 2007 on romantic partimento. And uh, so there are romantic partimenti. Uh, but you can compose you can compose a new partimenti. There's no I, I, I tried, so it is possible to compose new partimenti in whatever style you want. Um, I think not in a tonal style. <laughs> it's not base base base. <laughs> um, I'm sure you you get this question a lot. Should partimento be taught in, as a curriculum. Uh, one thing that's interesting about Partimento is it's very self-contained. I've noticed some people on YouTube, I see them putting Roman numerals. Um, I see people integrating it in some way into other music educational styles. Do you feel, I mean, this is kind of just not talking about how it integrates. So can you see Partimento being a serious part of early music education, do you think it, it can complement, go side by side with other music theories, or it needs to be kind of on its own because it's so self-sustaining? Oh, well, I, 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 I don't claim that you have to ignore Roman numeral analysis because that would be impossible. For example, if you want to use... Um, Kaplan theory or musical form, you, 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 are, you must know Roman numeral analysis, the notion of, of called the root of inversion. You have to know it, of course. But um, I noticed that if you try to realize a partimento and you start thinking uh, in terms of uh, root and inversion, uh, what it, takes, it takes long, uh, much longer than uh, thinking in in terms of intervals, so of course you you sh you have to integrate the things. Of course, you have to know what what. Uh, I mean, we, we cannot pretend that Ramon never existed, right? <laughs> <laughs> right, right. It wouldn't be fair, right? And, and I think uh, maybe this is just a, a messaging thing. But do you feel like uh, in in some ways? It, it doesn't have to be a battle. It doesn't have to be this side must win, that side has to lose. Or, you know, it, it can, it, we can all uh, learn and it can be a big tent and it's, 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 it doesn't have to be a war of music theory. No, of course not. Um, when, when, when I teach of, uh, harmony, for example, I, I teach inversion. I, I, I teach uh, fun, fundamental theory. Uh, fundamental best theory and inversion of uh, Roman numeral analysis. Uh, it depends. 
It depends on, on what your goal is. If you, if you want to, you have to teach harmony using the traditional harmo approach of harmony if you want to move in a certain direction. If you want to, <clears throat> to move in a different direction, you don't need it. So you, you, Partimento in this way is, as you said, self-sufficient. So you don't, you don't need, you never need um, um, Roman numeral analysis to realize the Partimento. But music theory doesn't end with Partimento. <laughs> so okay. You have to know this thing. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, I mean, uh, the fantastic Professor Giorgio Sanguinetti, thank you so much for being on the show for the second time. I hope we will be, have many more appearances in the future. I can't wait to read your, uh, your second, your revised edition. But remember, everyone, his new book is The Piano Sonatas of Beethoven. It's in Italian. You can order it. Go to the link in the description. It is a fantastic book. It's got so much information. We only just got to, to scratch a little bit about it, but I really hope you check out his new book on the Piano Sonatas of Beethoven. Uh, do you want to mention Thank anything you. else before you go? Any plans, any projects you want to plug? Um, not really. Um, no, I, I, I'm, I'm busy working at my new... Um, course on uh, 20th century music uh, starting mid-February and then and, uh, in a few weeks I will start working again at the new edition of my book. Well, we are all very much looking forward to that. So, wonderful. Thank you so much, Professor Sangonetti. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.